Unless you've been literally living in a nuclear bunker, you probably by now watched Amazon Prime's new series of Fallout. And if you haven't, then you really should get to it just as soon as you can. You may or may not be aware of this, but it's actually not an original idea. But rather, it stems from a long-running and much-loved video game series. In this video, we're going to look at the origins of Fallout, how it started modestly and then grew into the massive franchise that it is today. This may surprise you, but Fallout has actually been around since 1997, which at this point in 2024 is 27 years. In truth, the game's roots actually go back even further to 1988 and even beyond, because its themes and its imagery go back another 30 years to the 1950s. Now, to be honest, this adaptation is a pretty brave move. So many video games have been adapted for the big screen, and let's face it, they've generally sucked really, really badly. But the tide may have turned, because with the adaptation of The Last of Us into a TV series, The Last of Us has a strong narrative, and because of this, it actually came across really well, because it's a story-led game. And if there's one thing that Fallout is rich in, it's in story. And it has a very fully fleshed out world in which its narratives actually play out. So let's take a look at where the crazy characters and the themes of Fallout come from. But there is one other thing. If you can make it to the end of this video, I've got a little bit of a surprise for you there. It's a kind of three degrees of Kevin Bacon link between myself and the show's co-creator and director, Jonathan Nolan. So let's dive in and see how the Fallout universe came into being and some of its more charming and troubling themes. The atomic age was born. There is no denying that since that moment, the shadow of the atom bomb has been across all our lives. All men of goodwill earnestly hope that a realistic control of atomic weapons can and will be achieved. Meanwhile, good sense requires that all of us prepare for any eventuality. But wisdom demands, too, that we take time to understand this force. Because here, in fact, is the answer to a dream as old as man himself. A giant of limitless power at man's command. And where was it science found that giant? In the atom, a particle so infinitely small that it takes over a hundred billion billion atoms to make up the head of a pin. We've all had to deal with the fallout from some situation at some point, but very few of us have had to deal with the literal fallout from a nuclear detonation. And of course, none of us, thank heaven, have had to deal with the fallout from a nuclear war. Our story starts with the USA post-war era of the 1950s, where the atomic bomb loomed large in everyone's imagination. Here was a device that could wipe everyone out in a flash, and then go on to rain down radioactive fallout for years afterwards, further damaging the land and causing lingering destruction. A justifiable paranoia arose from the fear of this weapon and radiation in general, and the period saw a number of movies based on variations of radioactivity causing animals to gain giant size and then go on to wreak havoc on us puny humans. There were colonies of giant ants, giant scorpions roaming the land, giant wasps looming over hills, and of course the Japanese imagination spawned Godzilla. On the flip side of this, atomic energy was also a new possibility, and the 1950s in particular saw an optimism about this technology, and of course about technology in general and what it could bring to us. In the USA, both domestic homes and automobile design was used as a canvas, or maybe even as a laboratory, where new technologies could revolutionize the living experience. Into this domestic front of new design ideas, we must not of course forget the proliferation of both domestic and military rocket design. This was the era of the space race. And it was exciting, but of course, this excitement over the new rockets developed at home was tinged with fear over what Russia was doing with the space program. And in time, these new, more long-range rockets allowed nuclear bombs to be delivered to the USA mainland, which of course brings us full circle. So, we return to the downside of the atom. In the 1970s, fiction focused on what would happen if there were a global nuclear war. Planet of the Apes explored a post-apocalypse world in which apes replace us as the dominant species on Earth, and humans form underground cults who worship the nuclear bomb as if it were a god. In Damnation Alley, the world is racked by massively fluctuating climates. Radiation storms span the globe, and giant scorpions roam the deserts, killing people. 
In Mad Max, a lone warrior roams the Australian wastelands, fighting against ultra-violent tribes whilst being accompanied by his dog, who follows him, although somewhat hungrily. Into this landscape of post-nuclear war, angst, Interplay released a role-playing game in 1988 called Wasteland. Wasteland made use of an existing game engine that had been developed for their Bard's Tale series of games. This was a fantasy-based role-playing game, which had largely brought the genre of first-person RPGs to gaming, and it was a firm favourite of mine in the mid-80s. Interplay's founder, Brian Fargo, was director of this new post-nuclear war title. Wasteland would run with and explore the whole post-nuclear war set of themes. At this point in time, Interplay were a developer only, so Wasteland was bankrolled and subsequently published by Electronic Arts. As a result of this, Electronic Arts went on to own the copyright of the game, and more importantly, its IP. Over the following years, Interplay evolved into a publisher, while still developing titles in-house. The ideas and themes from Wasteland stirred around in Interplay. They really, really wanted to make a sequel. But Electronic Arts would not sell the IP for Wasteland back to them, as they had already greenlit a sequel with another developer internally themselves. So Interplay resolved they would have to leave that title behind and go on to create a wholly new game based loosely on the same premise. So in 1994, Interplay greenlit a new game, which they saw as the successor to Wasteland, and they apportioned a modest budget as funds were limited. Just some three years later, the game was completed, and it was released to the world. The first game in the Fallout series was simply called Fallout, but the game went on to have a number of sequels, so just to avoid confusion, we'll refer to this game as Fallout 1 in this video. Fallout 1 is an isometric 3D game, and it was released in 1997. It's the spiritual successor to Wasteland in everything but name. However, it's not actually a direct sequel to it. And the reason for this is because Electronic Arts owned the original Wasteland IP. Because of this, Fallout had to stand on its own two feet. It couldn't directly use any of the original plot, the monsters, the technology, and so on from Wasteland. It had to do this to obviously avoid any copyright issues with EA. So isometric 3D was a cool technique, mainly pioneered on the ZX Spectrum computer back in the 1980s. But by the late 1990s, as a technology, it was getting, to be honest, a little bit long in the tooth. Polygonal 3D games, they were actually a thing at the time. For instance, Quake had been released one year earlier, as I recall, and that had been an absolutely massive hit. So you must ask the question, why didn't they make the game in 3D? Well, these new 3D game engines, they weren't very mature, and they weren't really up to the, the task of actually producing a rich 3D environment with many, many objects at the time. These games struggled, to be honest, with creating just a few characters and a few items. They wouldn't have really worked for a game such as Fallout 1, what you know the game designers actually had in mind. And besides, they were difficult to develop for, and the tools weren't really there for actually making the 3D assets as well. So 3D isometric would have to do for now. Fallout 1 takes place in the year 2161, and this is some 84 years after a massive nuclear attack on the USA. In this attack, most of the major cities were destroyed and its populations decimated. You play a lucky vault dweller, one of the lucky few who had vault insurance with a company called vault -Tec. This insurance meant that you and a few select others had a safe place in the vaults to retreat to as the nukes detonated outside. Since that time, Generations of vault dwellers have lived in these vaults. And they live there waiting for the day when the radiation outside has dropped enough so they can emerge into the sun and help build a new America. The amazing thing about Fallout 1 is, is that it introduces so many of the core ideas and themes which went on to drive the whole series. Of course, given its budget and the inherent limitations of the technology of the time, not all of these were obviously massively fleshed out but at the same time, they were actually in Fallout 1. So let's take a look at these different concepts and themes now. Vaults are nuclear shelter bunkers, which were designed and built by a company called vault -Tec. There are many of these vaults, and they are scattered across the USA. Some of these vaults are easily located, as they have their robust entrances open onto hillsides or into the sides of cliffs. Whilst in others, they are more clandestine. They're secreted away in the sub-basements of buildings or within cave networks. 
Each vault is provisioned to allow all of its inhabitants to live in relative comfort until the wasteland outside becomes habitable once again. The vault tends to be a place where, to date, all of the Fallout adventures start. This may sound a little bit repetitive, but in each game you start in a different vault, at a different point in time, with a different set of circumstances that come into play. But in each case, inevitably, you are cast out from the vault and into the wasteland. And that, of course, is where the fun begins. <laughs> the vault is generally safe, a nurturing environment, but not all of the vaults are cosy. Some hold a dark secret. Who is Vault Boy? Well, he is a marketing device created by vault -Tec, and he's used in their advertising and educational films to show you the dangers of radiation and much more. He kind of follows the memes that you see in 1950s educational material about radiation and so forth. He is eternally cheerful, with his stereotypical pose showing a big thumbs up. Vault Boy is used in-game to show you what your different skills are and what they give you. For instance, he explains about radiation resistance by showing himself bathing in a vat of nuclear waste with no ill effects. He was also made as a series of toys, like this one. And I have to assume these were given out by vault as freebies as marketing for maybe little children, possibly also for adults. So as you travel in the wasteland, you may see the odd vault advert with vault Boy in it, or you may find a wobbling bobblehead of him lying in a pile of debris. Of course, living in a nice warm vault with clean water on tap and a plentiful supply of food does not breed a tradition of hardened warriors. So the vault dwellers trapped in their little time capsules are like a snapshot of 1950s optimism. They are organized and they're regimented. Everyone wears a blue overall. These overalls have emblazoned on them the number of the vault that they come from. Each vault dweller has their assigned role to keep the vault running and morale high within. So as a vault dweller, being cast out into the wasteland is something of a rite of passage in each follow game. And now also it seems in the TV series. Let me show you a Pip-Boy. This is actually a Pip-Boy, and these were supplied to all of the Vault Dwellers. They come in a box like this. Uh, this is actually an edition of the game, which the game actually came in here, and it came with this Pip-Boy as an extra. And the Pip-Boy is a kind of mixture of a smartwatch mixed with the sort of design aesthetics of a 1950s military radio. It's actually meant to be made out of metal, uh, this one is obviously a toy, so it's just made out of plastic. It has a clamp here, which allows you to uh, unlock it and open it. And you would actually put this um, on your wrist, uh, facing the other way around, facing towards you like a wristwatch. Um, why do you need a Pip-Boy? Well, it's a kind of... Um, this is how you actually interact with the user interface in-game. It has a map on it. It has uh, indications about your statistics, your health. Uh, it also has a Geiger counter here, which allows you to detect radiation when you're in proximity to it, to it, which obviously causes damage. And down here you have a radio, and you may actually pick up in-game radio signals about something that's going on nearby. So it'll be interesting to see in the TV series if um, that radio is actually uh, used and uh, the uh, character actually uh, receives uh, signals about uh, various things. This is pretty iconic. If you've played Fallout, then you will know about the Pip-Boy. Each version of the game had a different iteration of the Pip-Boy. So the earlier games it had, uh, let's say it was the Pip-Boy 1000, the Pip-Boy 2000, and I believe this is the Pip-Boy 3000 model. There are actually better models of this that you can buy. I believe there's a company called the Wand Company, and I think they actually did a kit which uh, allows you to actually make a much better model of this. Um, and I think that model is uh, more functional than this one. It has a lot more things going on. This particular one actually allows you to fit an earlier generation of mobile phone into this space here. And then you download an app. It actually allows you to have an interactive display on this model. So pretty cool, actually. So yeah, that is the Pip-Boy. And you will see this being used quite a lot in the TV series. Your character, the Vault Dweller, inevitably collects friends to accompany him in his journey. 
The spirit of Dog from Mad Max 2 makes a cameo in Fallout, and he actually is the first companion that you actually meet in-game. In Fallout, this character is called Dogmeat, and you meet him in subsequent titles, including Fallout 3 and 4, as far as I recall. You meet him in a chance encounter, after which he becomes your loyal friend, and Dogmeat then goes on to help you survive the dangers of the wasteland. Whenever you're in combat, Dogmeat will jump in and try and attack foes, and he will basically help you survive. In other games, there are other companions, and I have to assume that the TV series will explore companionship in the dangers of the wasteland. The very moment you step into the wasteland, you encounter dangerous mutated creatures. As we discussed earlier, these are the kind of memes that you see from the 1950s giant mutated creature films. In Fallout 1, these start as relatively non-dangerous giant rats, but soon you encounter giant scorpions and other mutated creatures. But the rat creatures, as they're known in-game, well, some of them are, most of them are, they came about because they bathed in high radiation, and some of them came about because of secret government experiments. And this has bred a large range of dumb and some not-so-dumb mutant adversaries. For instance, they're in the Nightkin. The Nightkin are very large but dumb humans who have a tendency for violence and even cannibalism. In later games, they become one of the core characters. In later games, they're actually called super mutants. So yeah, there are many foes for your Vault Dweller to survive, and that is part of the fun and sometimes the terror of Fallout. So ghouls are one of the more poignant features of Fallout, and they don't really fit into the 1950s uh, school of sci-fi. They're more of a reaction to the zombie films of the 1980s. So ghouls in Fallout, they are humans who have received very, very large doses of radiation after the bombs dropped. Now, obviously, most people who received this radiation, they would have died from radiation poisoning. But in the Fallout games, some people go on to live a very long time because of this radiation exposure. It has the opposite effect. It actually makes them live for a very, very extended lifetime. But of course, they get very damaged by this radiation. They usually lose their ears and their noses and other extremities. And they look like they've actually been burnt. So yeah, this life extension, it's a pretty twisted gift because they live a very long time, but they obviously uh, have paid a very heavy price for it. On top of this, there are other ghouls, and these are, they start out the same as the ghouls that I've just described, but their brain then gets damaged. And this can happen to normal ghouls at any time. It's called going feral. And when they go feral, they lose their intelligence and they become basically rabid and will attack humans on sight. So yeah, they're pretty scary, especially when you get gangs of ghouls. And then you have very, very highly radiated ghouls. Uh, these actually glow in the dark, <laughs> and they're called the glowing ones. And uh, yeah, they're really, really scary. Nuka-Cola has been a beverage in Fallout from the get-go. In-game, it was one of the best-selling drinks in the US before the bombs dropped. And it was a company with a very, very large marketing budget, meaning you will find its adverts and its drinks machines scattered everywhere in Fallout. Nuka-Cola was producing such massive numbers that even 200 years after the war, many bottles of it remain unopened, and they can usually be found in vending machines and in derelict stores and so on. Nuka-Cola is actually radioactive. I think that's to give it a little bit more oomph. And funnily enough, this is actually based on reality. I mean, Coca-Cola, for instance, when it was first produced, actually had cocaine in it. And there were drinks, I believe, in the 1930s, which had uh, radium in them, uh, which, you know, is radioactive. And uh, people believed at that time that the drinking and or consuming radi radium would actually give you some kind of extra energy instead of uh, yeah, radiation poisoning. There are many flavors of uh, Nuka-Cola, but you don't always find those in game. But in certain areas of the US, you do find those. And these different flavors have different effects on the body. So it'll be interesting to see which different flavors of Nuka-Cola turn up in the TV series. Nuka-Cola was very large. 
they had their own theme park, which is called Nuka World. And this is sort of akin to Disney World. And you can actually find Nuka World on the East Coast near Boston. In Fallout, the kind of robots that were part of 1950s science fiction imagination crop up from time to time. I'm talking about Robbie the Robot from Lost in Space and other robots of that elk. So in Fallout 1, there is the floating iBot. And in later games, you have the floating bots that basically read out propaganda. And they look a little bit like a floating Sputnik satellite. And in Fallout 1, you also come across automated gun turrets, which are actually pretty dangerous. Robotic items and characters actually play a big part in the Fallout series. One of the key robots actually is a range of domestic robots called Mr. Handy. And Mr. Handy actually does appear in Fallout 1. Mr. Handy has a personality which is based on an English butler. And they act as a sort of domestic cleaner, a butler, uh, sometimes a friend. They can give you advice as well. They, they're actually quite friendly. And uh, they play uh, quite a big part in Fallout 4. I would actually say that was where you see Mr. Handy really coming into his home. There is another version of Mr. Handy, which is a sort of militarized version called Mr. Gutsy. And uh, he has the personality of a kind of overly aggressive American sergeant. But it'll be interesting to see if we actually see uh, Mr. Gutsy in the TV series. There are also more terrifying robots. Uh, there are Sentinels and various other ones, and they appear in later episodes. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what we see of the robots in the TV series. So during the war with China, uh, which was blamed for the nuclear attack on the USA, the USA military developed a suit of very thick nuclear powered steel armor. You actually press a button, it opens up and you step inside it and it closes around you. And the reason why it's powered is so that when you're wearing it, you're not actually encumbered. You don't move the armor, you just move and it moves with you. Because of this, you can carry much heavier weapons and you are much less encumbered when you're wearing power armor. Also, you are practically invulnerable, although not totally invulnerable. And because of this, in-game, these suits of armor are very much prized and very often you will try and collect as many different types of power armor as you can. So yeah, power armor is actually a pretty cool aspect of Fallout. And talking about power armor, there is the Brotherhood of Steel. And the Brotherhood can best be described as a kind of post-Holocaust Knights Templar. They are a military organization, but they have sort of religious overtones. And their religion, if you can call it that, is technology. They have a particular fetish for power armor. And they have knights, and each knight wears power armor. And then you have a supporting cast of other people called squires who help the knights. And they then basically try to search the wasteland looking for lost technology from before the war. Any technology that they do find, they have a tendency to hoard to themselves. But they do have very uh, high technology equipment for the period of fallout. They tend to be pompous. And yeah, as I said, they do have a tendency to hoard the technology to their own use. But if you can become friendly with the Brotherhood, then obviously they're a really good ally to have. The Brotherhood actually crops up in the first game, and they are a common feature of future titles down the line of, of the series. So that's pretty much it for all of the features of Fallout 1, uh, the different themes and uh, characters that we uh, encounter in that game. Let's move on now and have a look at Fallout 2. In 1998, just one year after Fallout was released, Interplay published Fallout 2. You see the game here. So this was a relatively unusual sequel as it was actually greenlit six months before the original game was released. It has to be said that Interplay were obviously very confident that their new title would be successful before it actually even hit the shelves. And because of this, the original development team was still busy actually making the original game over here. So an external development team, Black Isle, were given the contract. Apparently Black Isle were put under enormous pressure by Interplay because money troubles at Interplay at the time combined with Interplay actually wanting the game to be completed very soon after the original game uh, 
was released really, really put on the, uh, the pressure. So as a result, the sequel hit the shelves in 1998, uh, just one year after the original game was released. So again, Fallout 2 uses the same isometric 3D game engine. And this made perfect sense, uh, perfect commercial sense if you think about it, because this is the way that you actually make any sort of profit out of a sequel. Sequels are a good idea because they make good use of the original title's assets. You don't have to develop everything from scratch. You've already done most of the hard work. And this cuts you know, development costs massively. Having said that, was Fallout 2 more of the same? Well, apparently not, no. Uh, reviews say that uh, it was a very good game in its own right, that it expanded on the original game pretty massively, which is amazing, really, when you think about the fact that they had such a short deadline to get this ma game made. You know, this game was being made when the first one wasn't even finished yet. So that's actually pretty remarkable. I have to admit, this is actually the only uh, Fallout title which is story-driven that I've not actually played. So. I'm not going to go into any great detail about it in this video because I don't really have any authority to do that. I have watched reviews on it. People uh, say it's very, very good. As you see, I've got the game. So at some point in the future, I will actually have to give this a try out and uh, see what it's like. Now, if you look at the graphical style of it, you'll see that it has the same, obviously the same engine, but it does have a lot new assets. And, um, you know, they followed the graphical style of the original very closely, which is pretty cool. But yeah, we're not going to dwell on it too much in this video simply because uh, I don't know that much about it. So anyway, let's move on and uh, take a look at Fallout 3. Until now, Fallout was a series originated and developed by Interplay. And this should not be forgotten, as it was Interplay's game designers and artists who originally set the mould for the Fallout franchise. But things were about to change. So the details for this are a little bit sketchy, so forgive me if I'm a little bit vague on this. Between 2004 and 2007, there was some murky business action between Interplay and a new company on the scene, Bethesda Studios. Interplay were somewhat strapped for cash, which seems to have been something of a theme for them in the previous 10 years. Meanwhile, Bethesda had been on a hot run with their own series of fantasy role-playing games, and this meant they had a lot of money in the bank. It appears Bethesda wanted a change of scenery from fantasy though, and it looks like Fallout was something of a favorite within the company. Luckily for them, Interplay, because of their money problems, had to reach out to other publishers and offer the Fallout series under a license. And what this deal meant was that the licensee could actually produce a series of three games based on the Fallout universe. And at the same time, it meant that Interplay agreed not to compete with them on that particular franchise. So Bethesda seemed to be very interested and they put in an offer and in the end, they actually secured the deal for $30 million. As I said, Interplay appears to have been on a pretty slippery slope financially because within three years, they are actually bankrupt. This meant that they decided to try and produce their own version of a Fallout game again. Now, as we just said, there were agreements in the licensing deal with Bethesda, which meant that they could not do this. So Bethesda knew that they had to take them to court and sue them because they could see that Interplay's new game would compete with their game. They'd been working on their game for quite a few years at this point, and obviously the deal was pretty clear. Interplay agreed that they wouldn't actually compete. And in due course, Bethesda won the case in court, and to avoid any further issues, Bethesda bought the Fallout IP outright. So legal shenanigans out of the way, what was Fallout 3 actually like? Well, in 2008, Fallout 3 hit the shelves, and it was a revelation. For a start, the development of the game started on the right side of the 3D gaming revolution. And this is something that had been building for the last 10 years on the PC platform. In the mid-1990s, gaming started to transition to 3D engines, but these were driven by pretty much the CPU of the PC only. By the end of the 90s, several vendors were democratizing the 3D rendering technologies, which had been pioneered on silicon graphics workstations in the 1980s and 1990s. And these were now being released as consumer affordable and quite capable 3D graphics cards. This meant that games could offload the 3D rendering to the cards, while the PC CPU could now concentrate on storing the game world and its mechanics. And this meant that there was a leap forward in the kind of complexity that 3D games could actually aim for. So Fallout 3 was in 3D, and what a difference this made. Instead of seeing the world remotely from an isometric 3D viewpoint, 
you were right in the action. And the previously pixelated images of Nuka Cola bottles, 10mm pistols, and rad roaches were now made more real as they were 3D objects that you could actually see in the world, pick up, hold, and actually interact with. On a simple level, Bethesda had taken the IP from Interplay and transposed it into their existing 3D game engine from their fantasy series. But of course, that doesn't really paint a fair picture of what they'd actually done. On top of this, the scope of the game was massively expanded by allowing you to explore the wasteland in an immersive 3D experience. No more was it a set piece of locations linked by a dot moving across a map. Now you move across the wasteland in 3D in an open world, allowing you to have much more granular and spontaneous set of encounters. You might find a ruined farmhouse or a store Little bit of Nuka Cola, Halloween decorations, and of course the odd ghoul or bandit. Another massive change from the first two games was its location. Fallout 3 takes place in a ruined Washington, DC, and unlike the previous two games, the environment was not as totally ruined. The map is not wiped quite as clean as it was in the previous two games. And this gave Bethesda more creative freedom, allowing them to bring in landmarks from before the war in various states of destruction. I'm guessing they got this idea from the scene at the end of the original Planet of the Apes, where the protagonist comes across the ruins of the Statue of Liberty rising out of the sands. There's very much this feeling when you actually visit Washington. Follow 3 brings to play a kind of morbid fascination that we all have with ruins. I know, you may not think that you do, but after all, what is Egyptology other than an entire field of academia based on routing around in the ruins of a past civilization? Take the ruins of Pripyat in Ukraine. This has become an odd kind of tourist destination, and let's face it, it's pretty much a template for the Fallout experience. A once thriving Soviet Russia era town trapped in time because of a nuclear disaster. People love to go there to root around in the ruins of schools, swimming pools, and even private homes. And everywhere is scattered the remains of people's lives as they had literally minutes to gather their belongings before being evacuated after the Chernobyl disaster. It does sound pretty familiar, doesn't it? So now you can roam a ruined landscape, but now there are familiar landmarks to give some structure to your travels, somewhere to actually head to. The game still has a pretty done palette, keeping in line with the first two games. The Fallout 3 game engine is really showing its age in 2024 now, but I suppose it would as it's a 16 year old game. Certainly it had to compromise in terms of what it could actually do. Very often in Fallout 3, real-world locations have shrunken down a little to fit in with what the game engine can actually do, and indeed what a PC of the day was capable of holding in its memory. So you wander around a pretty much fleshed out Washington, but it's a Washington that appears to have shrunken a little in the wash. All the same, it's still pretty epic, and was very impressive at the time. It was this game that I first actually encountered the Fallout universe in. I've been an avid gamer since the 1980s and a PC gamer since the early 90s, and for some reason Fallout 1 and 2, they just sailed me past. Now, you remember Jonathan Nolan, the Fallout TV series creator? Well, he was also responsible for co-writing the Batman movie, Dark Knight, with his brother, the Oscar-winning Christopher Nolan, who would then go on to direct it. However, it appears Jonathan is also a gamer, and he also found himself playing Fallout 3, and like so many, falling into the rabbit hole of the Washington wasteland. He says he liked the game so much that the Dark Knight writing took a backseat and was delayed a little. His brother had to wait for him to actually finish the game before the writing actually got done. Anyway, we'll talk a little bit more on this later. Now between Fallout 3 and 4 there was another release of Fallout and a very good one at that, and it's called Fallout New Vegas, and this was released in 2010. As you can imagine, it's set in a post-apocalyptic Las Vegas and its surrounding lands, and it is actually a very cool game and it's definitely worth playing if you have the time. But sadly, for the sake of brevity, we'll have to skip this game for now because we have so much to cover here. So let's move on now and have a look at Fallout 4. Fallout 4 is a special game for me. Why? Well, it's where Bethesda really perfected the whole Fallout cocktail. It was released in 2015, which is some nine years ago at this point and yet again moves location to a new city. In this case, we're in Boston, or at least what's left of Boston anyway. For the first time, they dropped the Dunn palette and instead opted for a more vibrant color range. 
I know what you're thinking. I mean, after all, this is a post-nuclear war game. It's meant to look really done and shitty. But they decided that, in truth, they could actually keep that color range for areas of the city where it makes sense. You know, the areas that have been blasted by nuclear devastation. But in other areas, they do allow the color to shine through. This kind of overall dark palette, it's akin to something that you see in movies. It's called color grading. And it's where in post-production they desaturate the movie, or they enhance some colors, or they reduce others to achieve a certain feel. But in Fallout 4, this overall color grade is removed. And now the game uses the ruinous colors only where it makes sense. In Fallout 4, the 1950s Americana really leaps to the fore. Of course, it had always been there to one degree or another, but in this game, the production design team introduces such gems as the Red Rocket gas stations, a drive-in cinema, and 1950s-style diners, and so on. The new color palette also allows these elements to shine through. The vibrant red of the Red Rocket stations would have appeared as a sort of dark brown, really, in the earlier games, but here, these stations stand out from miles away as a vibrant red. The game engine also got a large enhancement. This gave much more fidelity to the characters, the environments, and equipment. Also, the environment itself is completely open world. What this means is you can walk from one end of the game to the other with no loading, no delays. When you enter a certain building, there is a load, but apart from that, this game feels more fluid than ever before, and it changes how the game feels massively. There is a main plot, which you can follow, but there are so many other optional quests and stories that you can really play this game in a much more relaxed manner. Well, as relaxed as you can be in the Fallout Wasteland. <laughs> you can wander the wasteland having encounters with giant scorpions, bloke flies, raiders, super mutants, and so on. The range of foes and encounters in this game is massive, and due to its proximity to the coast, a lot of aquatic monsters such as Myalurks, which are kind of giant crabs, they sort of come to the fore. Even better, there's an entire ruined city of Boston for you to explore. Again, it's a scaled-down version of the real city, because obviously they can't fit, well, an entire real-sized city into a game engine still. But now, it doesn't feel quite as shrunken. There are skyscrapers that you can scale to their tops. You can traverse from a ruined building onto a semi-toppled aerial freeway, and then across a sort of rough plank bridge and into another building. This is actually pretty amazing when you play the game. Or you can go down into a subway, and you can route around in there below Boston, encountering feral ghouls, more Myalurks, raiders, anything really. You can sort of encounter anything in this game. Much of the weaponry in Fallout series has a homemade feel. There are pre-war guns around, of course, but you can find many cobbled together handguns and rifles. Don't forget, this is a world without any factories. So cobbled together weaponry and other equipment, it's a must really, you have to do some DIY. And in Fallout 4, the game engine allows you to take existing weapons and then customize them. This then goes to a whole new level because the game engine also allows you to build your own bases. You can actually build your own sort of towns with defense turrets and things like that. It's great fun. So there we are, Fallout, a game and now a TV series whose development has spanned to date five whole decades. Saying it like that does sound pretty nuts, but it's true. I think what will be interesting to see is what elements of the existing franchise will be brought into the show. Are they going to only feature existing designs and culture? Or will it develop new creatures, new in-world commercial franchises, new beverages, and so on? Each game certainly added to the lore and fun with crazy new monsters and locations. I suppose we'll just have to wait and see. And you've made it to the end of the video. So, my personal link to Jonathan Nolan. Well, back in 2008, I was working for the London-based special effects house, Framestore, as a visual effects lighting artist. I had just completed work on a golden compass, which then went on to win an Oscar for its VFX, which was pretty cool. And after this project completed, a couple of projects came up that I could move on to. And one of these was The Dark Knight. The funny thing is that beforehand, I wasn't very enthusiastic about it. The reason for this is that when you work in VFX, you don't really know about a film until you actually start working on it, because very often each film is secret to one degree or another, because the film directors don't want details of the film to come out. So you have to basically put your finger in the air and move on to a project without really knowing what it's going to be about. 
But anyway, I decided to give it a go. So I ended up on a pretty small team of people and we were given the task of bringing Two-Face's burned face to the big screen after his horrific burns. So what this involved is a team of people made a 3D model of the burned side of his face. And then another part of that team textured it to make it look realistic. And then another team then had to track that model onto the actor's uh, performance and then animate it so it would actually move with what he was saying and so on and so forth. So that was very difficult. By the time it had gone through that whole process, it was then passed to my team and we were given the task of lighting it and trying to make it look photorealistic so that when it was actually put together with a live action, it looked fully real. This was in 2008 and I must admit, I was very worried because this hadn't really been done before. This was a fully CG prosthetic that had to match up with a live part of the character, the character's real face. And this hadn't been done and I was pretty doubtful that we could pull it off to be honest. But I must admit that in the end, I actually think they look really cool. I'm actually more proud of the work that I did on that project than I was of the work that we did on The Golden Compass, even though that film actually went on to win the Oscar. So yeah, it's funny. Sometimes you just have to go with things and see how they turn out. I guess now it just remains to sit back, crack open a new Coca-Cola, nibble on a mole rat kebab, and enjoy seeing what Jonathan and the Bethesda team can actually bring to life in the series. I can imagine also that Brian Fargo and his ex-team at Interplay must also be very proud of what their game series has gone on to become. It's certainly an amazing journey, and it's one that I'm sure they didn't imagine when they were making Wasteland way back in 1988. But yeah, here it is. I think Fallout's going to be epic, and hopefully it will bring some new fans into the franchise, and they will also go on to play the games from which this wonderful franchise actually branched from. I hope you enjoyed this video as well, and if you did, please click on the like button. And if you did like the video, then please subscribe to the channel, because we'd love to see you back again for future videos. Anyway, enjoy the series, and hopefully I'll see you again in the future. Take care. attacks us with nuclear weapons. Danger will come not just from blast, or heat, or nearby radiation effect, but also from fallout. Fallout, which may occur miles and miles away from the blast. You need to know about fallout, what it is, how to detect it, and what to do to protect yourself against it. Everybody needs to know. Yes, this does mean you. Watch and listen. One day, these facts may save your life. What is this fallout, anyhow? Just bits of radio act fall out of the mushroom cloud of the nuclear explosion and settle on the ground. These bits of matter can be dangerous. You are exposed to some radiation every day from cosmic rays or other natural sources of radiation. These exposures are too small to hurt you. But when a wartime nuclear explosion occurs, a serious fallout follows. 
Thousands of tons of atomized earth, building materials, rocks, and gases may be thrown into the air. And the mushroom cloud containing them sometimes moves as high as 100,000 feet, nearly 20 miles up. Some of the radioactive particles spill out near the explosion site. Others may be carried for 10, 50, 100 miles or more. But how will you know if there is fallout? You can't hear, smell, taste, or see the radiation. But you yourself can detect the fallout particles that produce it. The easiest time to do this without special instruments is when the fallout is settling through the air. This starts any time from about one half hour to several hours after the explosion, depending on how far away you are. And it continues to fall for an hour or longer. Usually, you can see the fallout. So if there has been an explosion of a nuclear weapon within a few hundred miles of you, you should suspect every unusual concentration of dust in the air of being fallout. After an explosion in daylight, watch any unusual accumulation of dust. At night, put a white or light-colored plate outside. Examine it every 15 minutes or so. If dust is accumulated on the plate, treat it as fallout. The particles in that fallout behave like miniature X-ray machines, sending out radiation in all directions. If there are many particles, and if you are exposed to them long enough, you will be hurt. Others will be watching for that fallout, of course. Experts will estimate the probable path and speed of approaching fallout and try to keep you posted. But it may come before you hear any details by radio or otherwise. You must take precautions, whether you hear their reports or not. If radio stations are operating, you will hear reports, especially on the Conrad frequencies 640 or 1240 on your AM dial. As soon as it is safe for specially protected crews to get out into the open, these highly trained civil defense radiation detection teams will make a thorough check of radiation levels and characteristics. Those facts will be relayed to you by radio as fast as they come into civil defense headquarters in your area. Information from the radiation monitoring teams will be combined and analyzed by experts manning a central radiation control point. These experts, who know just how fast harmful radiation reduces in force, can predict when it will be safe for people to come out of shelters and resume normal tasks. We have warned that you may have to act before you get any detailed reports. Just what can you do if fallout comes your way? Find the best shelter you can. The more solid substance you can put between yourself and the fallout, the better. But an ordinary frame house with windows closed will give considerable protection. In a house, it's best to get on the floor, away from doors and windows. Or if you can, find a location with additional walls in the center of the building. A basement is even better if the house has one. Large buildings, such as apartment or office buildings, give good protection. The thick, heavy masonry of their walls and floors makes it hard for radiation to get through. Basements, inside rooms, or corridors on the lower floors are safest. The basement of any house or building will become a good improvised shelter if you block the windows with sandbags and place other sandbags on the floor above the shelter area. If you don't have sandbags, thick, solid layers of books, magazines, or newspapers, or even a series of file cabinets standing close to each other can cut the radiation danger. In some parts of the country, there are storm cellars or outside vegetable storage cellars. 
they may be used as shelters from fallout. If you plan to use such a cellar or your basement or any other shelter, stock it with food and supplies. To equip and supply your shelter area, you need some of the same things you might take on a vacation camping trip. First, sleeping equipment to fit your shelter area. Folding cots or sleeping bags and blankets. Then, food and water. There should be at least a two-week supply. You'll want plenty of fruit juices and lots of your family's favorite canned foods. The drinking water supply should be rotated often to be sure it's fresh. And don't forget such basic needs as sugar, salt, pepper, and other seasoning that your family ordinarily uses. Now, some equipment. A radio is very important. It should be a battery portable with spare batteries. A transistorized radio is best, as the batteries last longer. Next, you need light in the form of flashlights and a battery-operated lantern. Then, a good first aid kit. Now, plates, cups, silverware. A can opener and a bottle opener are important. Add to these things enough closed containers to take care of garbage and human waste. Especially if there will be children in the shelter, include some books and magazines, paper and pencils, maybe one or two small, simple games. The best protection of all is the special shelter built according to specifications of your local civil defense organization. This has an air filter to allow ventilation but keep dust out, and it has at least three feet of earth over it. It would be a good idea to go right now to your local civil defense office to secure plans for the type of shelter you want, and then to get busy on construction. Plans are simple, using standard materials. So maybe you can do the job yourself. But all this special shelter talk won't help very much if you are caught way out on the open road. If that happens, keep driving until you see a building, which may be a house or barn, church or school. Drive as close to the building as you can. Then get yourself and your family out of the car and take cover in the building. If you live on a farm and have sufficient warning, get your animals under cover and give them enough food and water to last several days. And if you can, cover any piles of hay or harvested crops that may be outside. If the explosion has been some miles away, you will have time to fill tubs and other containers with water before fallout arrives. All locations where outside dust does not penetrate will be safe storage points for water. Whatever kind of shelter you find, Settle down and make the best of it. If there are others with you, help them by being as calm as you can. And don't be discouraged. You can go out for very brief periods if you are well covered and keep the dust off your skin. Wear heavy boots or shoes and pants tucked in or tied around the bottom to keep dust out. If any dust gets on you, brush it off promptly. And when you have a chance, wash it off. That dust can burn your skin. But what happens if you do get exposed to a great deal of fallout? Food or water has been contaminated by the dust. Internal damage may occur. When dust has been left on skin, there will be skin burns. When you have been near dust too long, there may be radiation sickness. Exposure can even cause death. If you have had considerable exposure, you will vomit and grow weak. But after a few hours, this sensation will pass. And by the next day, you may have had the last of it. Even if you have been exposed to excessive fallout, you may eat and drink just as you normally would. But don't force yourself. 
Whether you have had these symptoms or not, if civil defense radio announcements have said that radiation has been high in your section, keep an eye on your condition for the next few days. Watch especially for these developments in the two weeks following exposure. Return of nausea. Sore throat. Bruise spots developing without any known reason. Loss of hair. These conditions, or nosebleed, or diarrhea, should be reported to a doctor or to the nearest first aid station set up under civil defense plans. Unless civil defense teams have warned that your area is still dangerously radioactive, you can get out and work to help yourself and help others. Although fallout can be deadly, your chances of avoiding damage from it are much better if you follow the directions we have given you. During an alert, keep your portable radio tuned to the Conrad radio frequencies, 640 and 1240 on the AM dial for the latest reports and advice. Right now, today, before there is an alert, take time to learn the civil defense five steps to safety. Learn warning signals and what they mean. Learn your community plan for emergency action. Learn protection from radioactive fallout. Learn first aid and home emergency preparedness steps. And learn how to use Connell Rad, 640 or 1240 on the AM dial for official directions.